Um, I, I want to start by sharing my journey because I really do believe that we all have different individual paths and the only way you can really appreciate someone's testimony after they've gone through so much and have, have aspired to success is by first hearing their tests that they've gone through. So Mahisha Dillinger, as you know, I'm from, born and raised in California. I've been in Dallas, Texas for about seven years now. Love it, I'm not moving back. Um, <laughs> taxation alone, I'm not moving back. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I'm from California and I wasn't born in the beautiful sunny side California, palm, be palm trees, beaches, the Kardashians. I was on the other side of the tracks. I was born into a very impoverished neighborhood, community, family. Generational cycles of poverty persisted in my family. Most people did not finish high school, much less college. Most of my friends were pregnant by 15. Some of their brothers didn't make it to see 18. So seeing success wasn't really, I didn't see success at all. I didn't have the opportunity to model someone that can help me and change my life. But I determined early on that I was not gonna live the same life. I determined and made my mind up that I was gonna change my children's de le legacy and destiny. And that was ultimately through number one entrepreneurship or education, but then also ultimately through entrepreneurship, which really changed my financial legacy. Um, able to be you know, independent, determine how far I go. Um, and I was a single young mother at an early age in the middle of college. My, I was pregnant and my boyfriend left me at six months and it was up to me to raise my daughter. That kept me going because I knew she single-handedly gave me a purpose and a reason to live beyond where I was. So I kept going, finished college. My mom helped me and she babysat for me. Went on to Intel Corporation, had an amazing stint there, ran into some bumps, couldn't shatter the glass ceiling and other ceilings I ran into. And I decided to leave and strike out on my own. And I did that um, without a lot of money, despite having phenomenal personal credit, I could not get a business loan to save my life. So I used the money I had from Intel and started small. And the business was very small, e-commerce based only initially. And then I started to reach out to other salons and the distributors started to reach out to me. And then one day Target called and said, we saw you and we like your brand. We saw you online. We like your brand and want to meet with you. And it was the easiest sell of my life. I've never had a meeting where I've gone into a room and sat down and five minutes later was told, we'll take everything. But that chance, that one chance, because I had pitched many other retailers for many years before that, and I got no, 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 no. That one chance with Linda Sullivan gave me my opportunity to show that I could do it. And so I went into Target, 105 stores on an end cap, premium location in a, real, in a retail store. They, were told, they told us that if you do well, we'll continue to grow with you, and, and so we did. And we went nationwide, and in the meantime, other retailers are to call for my brand. And so I took my life from being an impoverished girl from the wrong side of the railroad tracks to a multi-million dollar business owner. From hard work, determination, and just the sheer grit that came from showing my daughter and myself that we could be who we want to be. So now I'm a mother of four, that my daughter is, was going to be here with me, but she's at one of my other kids' track meetings, 24, 14, 13, and 8. And I'm busy. <laughs> and so I wanted to share that because this room is beautiful. I didn't expect so much diversity. I really didn't. But it's such a great room of different women, different walks of life. And I just want to share my journey in hopes of sharing and inspiring someone else in the room. And so now we want to continue with these beautiful ladies. And I'm so honored to be here with you guys. We have such an amazing set of inspiring ladies and different backgrounds. And I want to start by asking a few questions and let's get right into it and have a good time. This is for Gay, question for Gay. This discussion is about setting precedent and creating new norms. Tell us why you did things differently. Well, I grew up in a small town in East Texas and I didn't know that I couldn't do something because mm. I was a little, you know, a big fish in a small pond. But I'm gonna tell you, you're a cowgirl. And the reason is cowgirls take responsibility for themselves. Mm. And I learned that early on that if I was who I was, I could do anything I wanted to do. And there were all kinds of barriers and I, I, I can tell you hundreds of them uh, that I've gone through through the years. But I really believe, and the reason I wrote the book and you, I gave you a copy of all of it, uh, the paperback, uh, is that I want women to quit beating themselves up mm. for things we think we're not doing well. You are doing just fine. And once you gain that power and confidence inside yourself, do whatever you want. 
I mean, you know, you'd be surprised. Like these young ladies, look what they've done. Look what you've accomplished from, you know. And, and I went from, you know, kind of a small town kid and really didn't have much. And I had to work hard. Uh, because there was no options, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that I think that's the thing that I hope to instill in people, is that you can do what you want to do. It's all inside you. And we can't wait for everyone else to change the world. You take charge of yourself, and you will find the power you need to do what you need to do. Uh, and I will say one more thing. When I wrote the book, um, my publishing company said, okay, we've got to have the target market. I said, it's 20 to 35. Okay. But the surprising thing that I have learned uh, around the country going on book signings and speaking at events is that the book dips down to younger women, like your age, Isabel. And it all goes all the way up to women 50, 60 who are saying, you know what, I want to kind of restart things again. And I've had to recreate myself so many times through the years. And so I'm hoping it's a message of encouragement for women at all ages. Yes, I hope so too. I I think that I know that women of color in the entrepreneur world um, need a little more push and support um, because the rate is amazing. Like we're growing. African American female based businesses are on the rise. We're up three hundred percent, but less than four percent make it to the million dollar mark. And so that was the purpose of my show. The, re- the reason my own Oprah wanted to do it. Um, and so investing in any corporation that's here that has opportunity, that have a representative here, take it back. Um, let them know that when we approach you for support to think about giving that to that young black woman who needs support. I had a hard time with it. And that's why I want to call it to attention to it. Um, because there are many more Mahishas in the world that are trying to make it. And I'm trying to do that now, actually. I actually have an academy to help women of color help uh, get to their levels of where they need to be in their business lives. Um, but we need more than just you know one. We need those large corp- corporations to get behind us um, because we're creating jobs every day. That's the key. Question for Brooke. You experienced tremendous loss and anger, but you channeled that into action. Can you share more about your story? Absolutely. Um, When I was 15 years old, I ended up being thrown into politics, quite honestly, being thrown into having to be a voice for a community that wasn't getting a voice. So when I was 15, a good friend of mine was murdered uh, at the hands of two other students that we went to school with. It was very controversial. We had a lot of people in the community who were divided between how they felt about it and what they wanted to do about it. I had a lot of unbridled passions. I was full of anger, and I feel like I, if I wasn't so angry, I wouldn't have found my passion in life, which is to make policy change in this world. I actually wanted to be a dentist growing up all of my life, and wow. you know, I pass out when I see blood, so that kind of <laughs> worked out really Not quickly. A good idea. <laughs> so I'm, I'm almost honored to have known Nahum and um, was able to be put into this position to make change. So. I utilized all of my passion and I began talking with my parents. My parents actually told me that I should work on legislation that would prevent this situation from happening to anyone else. That if I cared so much about Naum, I would use his story to make sure that this never happened again and no one had to go what I had to go through or his family or our community. So I ended up working with a local congresswoman to draft a bill that was a gun violence prevention bill. Um, It didn't end up getting passed through myself. Another legislator actually passed it, but that kind of sparked my interest in speaking up for my community, especially sparking my interest in the Latinx community. So as a Latina, I felt like I needed to speak up for Naum, who belonged to the Hispanic community. I felt like our community, which was predominantly not Hispanic, was Mm. kind of sweeping what had happened under the rug. And I wanted it to be known. I wanted his life to be celebrated. And I feel like I I was able to make an impact for the Hispanic community, hopefully, where I grew up. Absolutely. You definitely did. Tell us a little more. I'm curious about the friend and how he was killed. What happened? He was actually... um, killed at a sleepover a couple streets down from my house. Um, He was Mm. killed over a dispute over a girl. And out of the 150 years that my hometown was, has existed, we've only had three murders. Mm. Two of them happened while I was in high school and were students that I went to school with, one of them being Naum. 
So this was something that I definitely wanted to make sure never happened again, especially in my own community, which was so small and had already faced three tragic deaths. Right. Thank you. Another question for you. I read that while you were growing up that you were always active in lively conversation discussions around politics with your family, yet you never voted to run for office. What do you think? Wait, this says, well, actually, I'm sorry. It says, um, you, yet you never knew how they voted until you ran, into off, ran for office. So you never understood the voting process until you ran for office. Right. Okay. So what do you think this was? So my parents decided to never let me know what their party affiliation was growing up. They never, we always talked about politics in my house. It was a constant conversation. My dad loves to debate about politics. My mom loves to chime in and share her perspectives on policy. It was something that I grew up around. Um, Although I will say my parents never envisioned me going into politics. And I don't think that they necessarily wanted me to because of the backlash that I've received, but they're so Mm. thankful that it has happened. I think my parents chose not to tell me about my, about their political affiliation because they didn't want me to craft my message and who I was around what they brought to the table. So their ideas, they wanted them to be separate from mine. And it's been, I mean, I didn't find out until I want to say it was the week after my election when I ran for city council and they I happened to find out because we had mailers coming to the house. And since Mm. I had run for office, I now understood that you receive mailers uh, if you have voted in that party affiliation. And I quickly realized Mm. that my parents don't belong to the same party affiliation. And uh, that was something new to experience. (laughs) Neither of them uh, belong to the same party affiliation. And it was something that I was so grateful that they never tried to push upon me and that they allowed me to really grow as my own individual and now that I have a very distinct party affiliation in addition to the issues that I stand for, um, they decided to tell me. And it was very interesting. I did not peg either of them for the mm. affiliation that they were, <laughs> really? but they were. So, <laughs> right. Wow. Gay, okay, another question for you. You come from a long line of cowgirls. What are the lessons that they've passed on to you that still apply today? Well, one can only go to the Cowgirl Museum in Fort Worth and walk those halls and read the words on the walls. And it's the ingraining of authenticity, being fearless, being confident, being competitive. And these women were such superstars, Mm -hmm. the ones I write about. back, and, And they're not the whole thing in the book. The book is really about my story of starting a business from the ground up with literally nothing but a $16,000 IRA. I mean, it was how bad it was Mm. in the late 80s. Uh, But I've gained strength from women I knew who were just everyday farm ranch people growing up, and they instilled in me their values. Mm. And uh, we we worked with horses a lot, and there's a relationship a lot of times between a young girl and a horse that's pretty hard. If anyone's ever had a relationship with a horse, you know what I'm talking about. But you learn to take criticism. And that's something that I really fear right now, especially in this Me Too movement time, that we're going to not get the feedback we need. Because when you're on horseback, if someone tells you you're not tying the slip knot right, you better listen because you're putting you and the horse in danger. And those are the kind of things that I grew up with. It wasn't like people were criticizing me as a person. They were telling me to do something this way or do it right because this is the way it's done. And so I, I really hope that we can all work together as men and women and not lose that ability to be candid and authentic with each other and take the feedback that we need to become better because that's how we grow and that's how we learn is when we can take that if it's positive criticism, we need mm-hmm. to take it and do something with it. So I learned that from the cowgirls and from the people in my life. And I've tried to put that in the book. But one thing that I, I really hope everybody kind of thinks about is you are in charge of everything you know now. You can become extremely expert or competent in anything you want to do. It's up to you. And uh, I have so many examples of people that work at T3 and different ones who have raised their hands and just jumped out and said, I'm going to become an expert in AI or this or that. And so there's nothing holding you back. Mm -hmm. And so I just say, go out there and be passionate about whatever it is. And if you don't even feel passionate about something right now, just poke around and it'll come to you. And, And you can be an expert at anything. 
You really can. And then once you do that, you become more confident. And then you become a more competent person. And then at that point, my little model says that you then can become very assertive because you know what you know. Hmm. And no one can take that away from you because you earned it yourself. So those are the things I learned from these cowgirls. And I've kind of, it's a metaphor in many ways for my life. You know, this book isn't all about just being a cowgirl and riding horses. It's the metaphor of how we take those lessons and use them in our lives today. Great analogies and lessons. And that's going to lead me to my next question, Timely. What are one or two lessons from your book that you want to share um, with everyone in the room? How much Prosecco have you all had tonight? (laughs) Not enough. Not enough. Uh, Well, I want to say there's two. Um, The first thing is there's a little box that I found at my mother-in-law's house right after I started my company and it was a little enamel box and on the top of it in very lovely handwriting was everything is sweetened by risk and I kept looking at it after I started my company and you know what it's like both of you to take and all of you Mm -hmm. to take a risk and she said I want you to have that so I took it back and put it on my desk and it has really been this mantra for me all these years because I realized that The brass ring only comes around so many times. And if you don't grab it when it comes around, you may never get that chance again. And what if you fail? You know, like these young ladies said, what are they going to do? Say no to you? But it's, it's really that just, it's scary sometimes. But look at the risks that are out there for you. You know when you can take it and do it because your life will be enriched and you will be sweetened by it. Your life will be sweetened. And now I'm going to tell you the other side of this because I've learned a lot running a business for 30 years. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary last week. And um, one of the things that I made the biggest mistake on in my career as a business owner was letting people creep into the organization who looked good on paper. Mm. They had all the references. They, they mm. had, knew the knowledge and everything, but they were jerks. And so I had this <laughs> phrase... You're so nice. Well, they, some of them are, you know. And so what happens is they come in and they spoil the spirit mm, of the company. Yes. They spoil the they're culture. They become, they're toxic, you know, and everybody knows it. And the longer you put up with them, the longer you let this just go downhill. So I have a very catchy little phrase that just sums it all up and it says, sometimes you have to shoot the assholes. And you do. <laughs> because if you don't, then you're going to ruin everything around you. I don't care if it's a nonprofit or what. And I've just had this funny thing that, you know, I've made some mistakes and hired some of these people. But the faster that I get them out of the organization and have those fierce conversations, mm-hmm. the world becomes better again. Yeah. And I must say, in defense of the assholes, though, <laughs> that they may be an asshole to you, but free them up. Let them yes. go because they could be a saint someplace else. else. <laughs> and so free them. Let them go. And you'll feel really good. And, and eventually they will too. <laughs> well, I, I like your philosophy. I don't know if I will get away with it, though. <laughs> I really understand that challenge. It really is hard. It's hard. It's, it's hard. hard. I know it's hard. I'm, and everything's I'm not making on paper light of and it. then you get them and it's not the same. And you wish you could just toss them in the wind. Yeah, yeah. it's tough. It's very tough. Well, you invite new parents, both mom and dad, to bring in their babies into the office. Wow, that's amazing. Why did you decide to do that? Uh, Real quick, this is a program that's been going on for 28 years. It was well before its time, and I was naive when I started. But uh, uh, 28 years ago, we were starting to do a lot of work for Dell, because I was in Austin that was home base, and we were doing a ton of work for Dell Computer Corporation. And so I had four women, and I only had 36 people at the time, Four women that were on that team, and they were critical to getting the work done and getting that client up to speed. And I don't know what happened. I still think I must have missed an ice storm or something, but four of those women got pregnant very near the same time. (laughs) Wow. Uh, I've never figured out. And one by one, they came and told me about this. So bottom line, what we did is I just said, bring the babies up here. (laughs) What do you mean, bring them up here? No, this is not daycare. And my lawyer called me, my attorney, Mm. because the CFO ratted on me and told him what I was about to do. (laughs) And so he said, you can't do that. You're not a licensed daycare. And I said, Doug, you just watch me. It's the right thing to do. So we did it. And through the years, we've modified and done these things. But to this date now, we've had over 100 little children 
that have grown up at our office mm-hmm. until they're six to nine months. Mm-hmm. And dads have brought in the babies too. It's a big family. It's part of who we are. And dogs come up there now too because a lot of people <laughs> said, dogs are like my children. Well, that's fine. Bring them too. <laughs> uh, but it's been a, it's probably one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life mm-hmm. because I've allowed women especially to not have to jump out of the game. And we all know how hard it is. And yes. I'm a mother of three. How yes. terribly hard it is to leave that baby. It, mm-hmm. Back when I was doing this, it was four to six weeks. Yes. It's the same. You know. Well, yes. You know. And I would absolutely not do it. I did not. And thankful for you that your employees can actually do that. That's a beautiful thing. I wish I had it. I just decided to take unpaid leave. Yeah. Unfortunately, because I wasn't leaving my baby four weeks. Well, I'm hoping more people, I've, I've influenced quite a few people to try this, but it's not caught on like the way I should, I think it should, because I honestly feel like that a lot of men and a lot of, a lot of women, a lot of people running businesses think if you let something like this start, it's impossible to draw it back. Hmm. And then it gets out of control and you don't know how to handle it and it becomes, you know, a liability in some way. But for us, it's part of our culture. It's who we are. We help bring up these children. And I've watched them grow up. Mm. And last thing on this is a couple of years ago. Oh, I'm out of time, I think. But anyway, a couple of years ago, uh, I had two interns come in. And guess who they were? The first two T300 kids. No way. I love it. I didn't know about it. They surprised me. So anyway. Question for Brooke. And we all want to know, what was running for office at 18 like? Amazing. <laughs> Well, I um, I mistakenly had grown up in a little bit of a bubble. I thought for some reason that if I jumped in there at 18, I had already been drafting these bills. I had a lot of support from my community going into the bills and then the nonprofit that I started back then, and people were really enjoying what I was bringing to the table, so I was like, take it one step further. I have a lot of issues that I've I am very passionate about that happened to be local level issues at the time. And so I just decided, you know what, I'll run for city council. You get paid $400 a month. I didn't have to have a part-time job in college. I was thinking, you know, I was a freshman in college when I chose to run. And I was like, Mm. these things are going to be, this is going to work out perfect. This will be my extracurricular activity. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I was like, yeah, you know, I'll just make policy in the nighttime, go to school in the daytime. That's what I'm going to do. I realized very quickly that the actual journey into campaigning was a lot tougher than I thought it was going to be. Um, my, I mean, honestly, I was criticized for being a Latina. I was criticized for being a woman, regardless of my Hispanic identity. I was criticized for my looks. Somebody told me that I would be using my body for votes. Um, I had gossip articles written about me, online campaigns. That was another story, being that I went to high school in this community, so everybody who was anybody at that time was saying something terrible about me on social media. Um, I was told that I was too brown to be voted in for that community that I lived in. Uh, Mm -hmm. A man actually told me to my face in a meet and greet that I was hosting that uh, he couldn't vote for me because he was brown, but he liked my message. These were things that people actually told me. Um, So it was very difficult to have to reel back from this. But my mom always tells me, and I thought thought this was critical to share with you guys. She tells me, it's not who you meet, it's who meets you. And after I ran, I was devastated. And I also was frustrated. I was like, gosh, I've given this community all of my time, all of my effort. I thought you would love me and swaddle me and just appreciate everything that I had to bring to the table. But... I was given a different side of something that I needed to see so that I could realize what I was passionate about, but something I don't know that I was ready to see yet. Mm. But luckily, with my mom always supporting me and giving me advice like this, I realized that I didn't do it for myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it necessarily for even the issues I was focused on. I did it for the people who met me. The people who wanted to see change, I wanted to represent them. If they didn't vote for me, although I do thank the... um, hundred people who did vote for me. <laughs> I was shocked, you know, because my mom and dad are only two votes. So um, even though I didn't get elected, I have to thank those people who met me yes. because they were able to have been impacted by something I did that I was just trying to do as a part-time job, really. I kind of like accidentally ended up in this. So it was an incredible sp- experience, just not in the moment. Yes. Courageous, courageous. Thank but Thank you. you. So... 
Dr. K and Brooke, thank you guys for your time. Thank you yeah. for your lessons and all your pearls of wisdom that you share with us. Thank you for being here with us thank tonight. Thank you for your leadership. Thank, thank you. you.